Hello everyone and a warm welcome to all our listeners. Thank you for joining us for the webinar on multi-device testing, challenges, considerations and solutions. By way of introduction, my name is Shreya Nair and I am the Business Development Executive for Asia Pacific at Upside Learning Solutions. I would quickly like to cover some of the interaction modes for this webinar. Uh, you can use the chat facility to share your comments or questions as the panel responds to them. We also have some polls lined up for you during the course of the webinar and we look forward to your active participation. Now I would like to give you a crisp introduction on our company, Upside Learning Solutions. For over 10 years, Upside Learning has been helping organizations across the globe belonging to varied industries manage their training goals. We have been successfully delivering a wide range of innovative learning and technology solutions. Headquartered in India, we have our presence across UK, USA, Australia, Middle East, South Africa and other countries. Um, our innovative learning solutions include our award-winning responsive upside LMS, our multi-device e-learning, multi-device testing lab, custom e-learning and custom m-learning solutions. And here is what keeps us going, our awards and recognitions that we have won from bodies such as Brandon Hall Excellence Awards, Training Industry, Deloitte, Chief Learning Officer, Apex, and Red Herring. We have also won the award for e-learning team of the year 2013 by e-learning age awards. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our key speakers for today. Gira Bellari, who is the AVP uh, Learning Designer at Upside, and Jeevan Joshi, Director of Client Solutions, Asia Pacific. All right then, let me quickly take you through the agenda for today's webinar. Starting off with the answer to why multi-device testing, we will be moving on to talk about some key challenges and um, today's, uh, that today's NLD teams are facing and ways to overcome these challenges through testing tools and stimulators. Uh, we would finally be moving on to giving you a quick introduction on Upside Learning's multi-device testing lab. Uh, moving on to some key factors uh, that have urbanized the multi-device ecosystem. One being the changing or rather changed computer paradigms as we can see that we have come a long way from using huge mainframes to maybe small personal desktop computers uh, to networking to the internet and the world wide web to mobile devices and cloud computing. Learning solutions today need to keep up with the latest technologies and be served up on the latest devices. Let's not forget that better technology meant better productivity. Another reason for multi-device testing can be BYOD policies gaining acceptance. Nowadays, as we know, uh, that most of the organizations are accepting this policy. Gartner had predicted by 2017, most organizations will require MP employees to maybe supply their own device for work purpose. And, and why not? Like Nowadays, employees often bring their new devices from home and use them at work. Everything from, from tablets to tablets have, have entered the workplace. And, Employees no, lang no longer like wish to carry around two separate machines and instead they practically would like to club their uh, machines like maybe for personal and professional use rather than carrying around multiple devices. So uh, better technology at you know, competitive prices have made policies such as BYOD practically possible and gaining more acceptance by the day. Uh, one of the other reasons can be you know, changing work trends. Nowadays it's all about flexible working a trend that, uh, that you know, Emerging Technologies Outlook program had predicted that, uh, that way back in 2001. This includes like flexible timings, schedules, telecommunicating from home, uh, contracting, and um, another report that top 10 workplace trends for 2014, written by Dan Schwabel, had predicted that freelancing will become a normal way of life to the extent that there might be more freelancers, contractors, and consultants than full-time workers that we experience these days by maybe the next coming six years. So now the, the, the real question lies in that have organizations proactively created a flexible environment to deal with the changing work trends? 
this means your training and performance support material has to be multi-device ready so that it can easily be accessible to your entire workforce no matter where they are, when they choose to work or what devices they use. Uh, another w reason can be like the increasing number of millennials entering the workforce that has led to a significant use of multi-device. According to a report submitted by Business Professional Women's Foundation and Deloitte, there was a survey that predicted around 75% of the global workforce is going to be millennials by around 2025. And how would millennials like to learn? I mean, it's, it's surely evolved just like technology and they would not stick around to the old technologies. I mean, millennials might be more accustomed to technologies such as Wi-Fi, 3G mobile networks, instead of a dial-up broadband or would any day prefer a tablet or a smartphone instead of a traditional PC. They're often using more than one device. Simultaneously, they would prefer real-time information to get things done no matter where, when and how. From a learning solutions viewpoint, Personalization will go a long way, creating a very dynamic but consistent experience for your employees, giving them the data they need to do their job or accomplish their task. So now knowing the driving factors for multi-device testing, let's quickly move on to some of the key challenges that can be faced by L&D teams to accomplish this. Over to you, Jeevan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shreya. Um, so I hope, uh, hope you can hear me. Um, and uh, yeah, look, it's a it's an extremely uh, interesting world that uh, we are coming into, where um, all sorts of content is being accessed by all sorts of devices, and uh, that uh, you know certainly gives us flexibility and accessibility to content, but in the production does pro provide some um, from some challenges. So you know the journey to multi-device uh, learning and testing um, you know has been one that has accelerated over the past uh, couple of years. Um, where you know essentially from a single PC screen really that's where you kind of did most of your computing um, then came uh, you know um, the tablets uh, from from um, you know the uh, the iPad from Apple really um, increased the volumes of tablet usage and uh, thereafter what's also happened is that smartphones came and within the tablets smartphones desktops phablets and all the other variations there were also lots of screen variations, operating systems. Um, so it just that just the number of devices that we have the ability of accessing content through has increased uh, manifold times, uh, which is which is great for uh, for people. They've got more choice. It may not be so great for people like us who are uh, interested in delivering for a certain budget. Uh, it just makes it more, um, I guess, a little bit more challenging to um, to make a good good product. So the first poll, and I'll ask the team to bring the poll on the screen when they're ready, is uh, how much experience do you have of multi-device testing? And this is just to get some sense of how many people are actually involved in testing and multi-device testing uh, you know, versus others who might be uh, learning specialists. So uh, if we can launch the poll, um, that'll, be, that'll be fantastic at this point in time. OK, so um, the, polls, uh, the polls are coming up. and. Uh, It'll be, we'll just close after some time. Yep, so if we've got enough responses, uh, if we can close the poll, that'll be, that'll be great. L thank you very much, and let's uh, share the results. Uh, you know, essentially, you can see the results there that, uh, you know, um, there's, uh, yeah, basically the last two choices are the ones where um, it's, uh, it's available. So um, thank you very much for that. It actually does help us uh, in terms of just understanding where you where you're coming from. Okay. Uh, second poll, um, and look, um, I think this is um, it's a little predictable. I'm sure a lot of people use multiple devices, but let's launch the poll in any case and just get a sense of uh, get a sense of uh, how many devices have you tested. And um, I'd like to see especially the last response, uh, tablet, desktop, and smartphone. Um, so whenever the team is ready, if we can uh, just close the poll and share the results, that'll be, that'll be fantastic. Okay, I think uh, probably time to 
close the poll and wait for that result coming through and sharing. So yes, oh, that's that's a good result actually. So uh, wonderful. Uh, we've got some people who are interested in in all three types of devices, um, and all of you kind of have some experience um, there. So the different combinations. So it's good to see that good to see that yellow line. Okay, so if we can close the poll and move on to the next um, screen. What you'll see in the next screen, though, is is uh, something uh, which is looks like a peacock, actually, but um, it really is a depiction of the various combinations that us learning technologists and learning specialists are faced with in this multi-device world. Uh, what we've got is essentially different screen sizes. Uh, that's the the second most in a circle there. And uh, you know, I just got a Samsung 7-inch. Um, I've got an iPad 10-inch. I'm getting used to the 7-inch. Um, I've got an Apple iPhone 5. Uh, we'll be moving to a 6 very soon, and it's just amazing the number of screen sizes that are available. Uh, just not um, screen sizes, but also tablets, which can be added to the keyboard. It becomes a laptop, and uh, it's just um, amazing the amount of uh, variety that we have. Um, next is really the browser. So there are obviously some browsers that uh, dominate and all. We have some stats on the slide coming up next, um, namely you know Firefox, Chrome, and Internet Explorer. Um, but uh, and of course in the Apple world uh, you've got Safari. Um, and uh, in terms of the different um, guess platforms and operating systems, huge amounts of operating systems. So you know within the Android you've got different variations. Samsung has customized quite a bit the Android. Uh, we've got Windows making a strong comeback. Uh, Apple's of course as strong. Um, Blackberry seems to be making a little bit of a comeback. Maybe it won't be a, a, as strong as it was before. Um, for all of these different combinations, um, you could, uh, you know, you have to test con content and functionality, usability, compliance, uh, you know, for browsers, etc., and also performance. And uh, in the subsequent slides, which I think we should get to very soon, um, Gita will talk about you know the subtle differences that you will see on the screen that we'll share with you, and it is uh, it just uh, demonstrates the challenges for testing. Um, so you know, for when it comes to testing, I think what is quite important is to define the target environment, because in the previous slide we just saw the variation. So are you going to build? a solution that meets each and every one of those combinations. And I believe if you were to multiply the number of permutation combinations, they'll probably be in, in like a million or so combinations. So in a way, you kind of need to define saying, look, um, we know there's a lot of variation out there. One approach is that we kind of build for the most common specifications, and that will limit the amount of time and development uh, and, and the budget required, and say anything outside of uh, that target environment um, you know, is, is something that we'll, uh, we'll deal with uh, or we want support. So you'll probably have to make a choice, which is a different th difficult thing to do, because in the PC world, it was pretty easy. It was just Windows PC and Internet Explorer, but we've got a lot more variations. Um, just looking at the, uh, the statistics which the team has uh, put together is uh, you can see that Chrome uh, has uh, 60, almost 62 percent, IE has 77.8 percent, Firefox is 23.4, uh, Safari is 3.8. Um, now I've recently moved from Firefox to, um, to Chrome, but what the statistics does hide is that in the corporate world where a lot of people, uh, a lot of us are, um, IE still is uh, is is the browser of choice, um, and especially some of the older versions of IE, uh, and you can see that um, you know um, that uh, there's some some people on IE8 at the moment, some companies, and it's quite for us it's very challenging to design for IE11 and some, but also meets IE8. So it's it's uh, something that we've really had to apply our brains on, and we've come up with a framework called FRED, which we will um, cover a little bit later, FRED standing for Framework for Responsive uh, Evaluation of, uh, sorry, uh, Framework for Responsive um, Development uh, of e-learning development. Um, then we talk about the um, platform statistics. You can see, again, the variations within Windows itself. Uh, Windows 8 is 21%, um, but, uh, but you can see the mobile is 5%, uh, but that number is going to increase. Um, and there's obviously also, um, you know, uh, Apple, the environment. Um, you know, option two is really kind of optimization, is that you build the, um, the, the learning solutions for, um, I guess, um, you know, um, that for, for, a framework that works best on most devices, right? 
And within that, you can see that again, you have to cater for a lot of variations. That also dictates the amount of testing that uh, you know you will you will do for that. So again, uh, mobile is also huge, and within mobile, uh, it's a huge trend. So people are accessing more and more from mobile, um, and I certainly am spending more time on my tablet rather than my PC. Um, so you know those considerations also need to take into place. So you know putting together all these combinations, you really kind of need to be very clear about the device type, screen type platform browser um, version and, and uh, then you kind of have test cases you know within them and you decide you know how much uh, what are you going to support I think it will be impossible to support each and every combination as we mentioned before uh, also you know defining the the target uh, you know in, environment uh, is is the next phase where we talk about um, the you know what the physical devices so do you actually have those devices that are listed in the testing matrix available to you um, you know can we use tools and simulators to cover the missing ones so you know there have been instances where instead of actually having the the physical device you can use a simulator um, and that gives interestingly the answer is uh, a lot of the times you could but a lot of the times also you cannot you cannot replicate the experience of an actual physical device on a simulator and there are we found instances where uh, it looked okay on the simulator but uh, you know didn't didn't work that well on the actual device so you can imagine if you're doing testing with all those screen and operating system combinations you really need a big, big collection of devices uh, which um, you know which obviously <laughs> keep changing every six months um, so you can imagine the kind of infrastructure that's required to have all those devices in place in your organization uh, and simulators are of some help but uh, not much so in our experience actual devices are set up and very much required for accurate and comprehensive testing results and we have actually set up a lab uh, which um, has all uh, the major devices uh, with different versions, different operating system, different screens, which really allow, uh, allows us to uh, you know do fairly robust um, testing. Uh, secondly, to back up this um, this fairly extensive lab, uh, we also have a lot of experience and effort um, in terms of testing, and because we do build a lot of online courses, especially for uh, for uh, for devices, mo mobile devices all the experience comes into play in terms of not only defining the test cases but also testing uh, and you know hopefully also resolving some of the issues that might come up during testing so um, for example you know the smart use of keywords is something while logging issue is something that we use to make sure that, uh, that we're able to identify issues very quickly um, and uh, you know we do uh, have, you know we because we have a substantial substantially large team uh, for for testing uh, you know we are able to kind of test and retest and re-verify you know pretty much all combinations so I guess the, the message there is that uh, moving into this multi-device world from a PC world which was based on flash uh, was very very easy um, but we are moving so fast in fact we're not moving fast we're being dragged into the multi-device world by our learners and our consumers uh, which means that the amount the the effort the sophistication and the uh, the budget required for testing um, is is going to be is going to expand and that's where upside provides uh, that service and we'll cover that a little bit later uh, in terms of uh, uh, doing that for you what I'm going to do now is uh, just give me a second while I now hand over uh, the presentation um, to um, Gira and who will take uh, and actually go into a lot of detail and I actually do love uh, this uh, part of the presentation where um, we delve into the nitty-gritties of testing. So over to you, Gita. Thank you, Jidan. And um, can you see my screen? Yep, it's there. Okay, all right. Um, so thanks again. And uh, yes, we, we thought uh, we'd like to share some of the, the common issues that uh, um, that we found um, based on our, our own testing experiences. And I have somehow or the other my PPT has decided to go back to an earlier slide. So That's all right. Reinforcement is always good. And I don't know what it is. Sorry about that. This is where I want it to be. Okay. Um, so we'll start with the question again, perhaps in continuation of what Jilin had asked earlier. So for those of you who have had experience uh, testing on multiple devices, was there anything that you found you needed to test differently or additionally 
or you know, if, if even if you haven't had experience, if you were to, to start this, what would you imagine that you'd need to do differently or specially? So you can type in your answers into the chat window if you'd like. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll just move ahead and you know if, if anything does come up that you'd like to share, please do go ahead and, and, and put it into the chat window. So multi-device testing definitely is a, is a very intricate uh, and time-taking and complex task also. Um, it's about testing, it's about re-verifying every combination then and it takes time. And if you don't do it meticulously and comprehensively then learners could face quite a wide range of problems. Um, so as Jeevan had shown this uh, peacock, as he called it earlier, um, these are the four broad categories then of, of testing and we've tried to list the parameters that we consider uh, and that we test for under each of these categories. And we'd like to then give you some examples under each of these categories. Uh, the first one then relates to browser differences. And um, by this essentially we're referring to the fact that every browser would have its own HTML rendering engine and interprets JavaScript a little bit differently. And that's what can cause inconsistencies across browsers. And we have come across content, uh, functionality, and even usability uh, inconsistencies then. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, this is two desktops running the same operating system, but uh, different browsers. Uh, so we got uh, IE and Firefox, IE 10. Uh, on Firefox, you can see that uh, the tower first logo, so that image is displayed correctly. It's positioned in the center. And it's complete, and on IE10, it's, it's just, you know, the alignment has gone off and it's getting cut. Um, here's another example. This is a video, actually, that's playing. And uh, again, desktop, Windows 7, but again, two different browsers. One of them here is IE8. Um, in IE8, you can see that the, uh, the video has shifted down. Its control panel has actually gone and shifted underneath the controls of the course. So one is visual misalignment, it doesn't look great, and the second thing then is that this is going to inter interfere with the functionality uh, from the learner's viewpoint. Uh, here's another example again of functionality due to misalignment. So um, here the, the white rectangles that you can see in the left screenshot, they have shifted out to the right, so they've gotten misaligned. Uh, so visually, again, that obviously looks untidy. But it just so happens that on this particular screen, these white rectangles are hotspots. So they're supposed to be points of interaction for the learner to go into any of those sections, section one, two, three, or four. So with them becoming misaligned then on one particular combination, um, the learner would find that there's an error then um, in the actual functionality of, of that screen. Um, Another aspect related to browsers and specifically to Internet Explorer is about the, the level of HTML5 support. So IE8, for example, has very minimal support for HTML5 elements, while IE11 has complete support. So um, here we can see that IE8 doesn't support rounded corners. So what we get then is, is, is a button with sharp edges, with a rectangular button. So from a testing viewpoint, again, when it comes to multi-device testing, it's also important to, to know that in such a case, this is not necessarily an issue which needs to be logged. This, there's, not, there's nothing wrong here. This is something that is done intentionally and um, that is, it's coded in, in a way that uh, you handle HTML5 support and you have fallbacks or different ways to handle um, what is not supported by HTML5 elements depending on what the uh, configuration is. So yes, as a tester then we, we wouldn't be logging something like this. So we wouldn't treat it as an inconsistency. Image quality, again, is something uh, that we noticed was different uh, across different combinations. So here we have two desktops, same operating system, different uh, browsers, and iPad. Um, so on the iPad, as expected, sharp edges, the image is, is nice and clear. Same thing with Firefox. However, uh, Chrome running on the desktop, we realized that there are jagged edges on the same image. So again, that's where, you know, when it comes to multi-device testing, um, it's important to have that optimized combination defined and, and to really make sure that, you know, we're looking at, at visuals as well as content then on, on every combination. Uh, text readability is something that will differ from device to device, um, depending mainly on resolution. 
So the higher the resolution, the smaller the text appears. So again, as a tester, it's not necessarily about inconsistency. Um, the text size, you may not really want to expect it to be the same unless you really hard code it to, to but even then, it's, it's going to differ based on resolution. It's more about looking at it from a usability point maybe and just seeing, is it comfortably readable then on, on every device and, and every combination? Um, and in this case, so we have here uh, um, two smartphones and one Samsung tab, um, slightly, I think this is a seven inch tab. And yes, it is, the text does look smaller on the seven inch tab, but it's readable, it's fine, it's comfortable. Um, another thing we found when doing multi-device testing is uh, the aspect of uh, content meaning getting affected. Uh, so when we get to multiple devices, layouts will change and arrangements will change. So if you look at the screenshot on the right, um, you have two speech bubbles and the stems of those speech bubbles are pointing generally to the, the face area um, of, of the characters. Now, when we get onto a smaller device, a portrait iPad or a portrait tablet, um, we had kept the same layout because it was still visible, readable, and you know it, it was okay that way. Um, so as a tester, then if we look at this, well, the content is complete, the text is correct, the, the graphic is okay, there's, there's no jagged edges, but uh, we need to look out for additional things. So here, if you see on the left, the stem of the speech bubble appears to be pointing to the person's hand, and that's just illogical. So it, sometimes it's about one step more than in testing when it comes to multi-devices because you've got to look out for you know, content meaning getting affected. Technically, everything is correct. If you, if you were to sort of maybe test this against the storyboard, all is good, but it just it doesn't make sense. Um, this example is more about uh, usability than across uh, devices. Um, so here on the left-hand side, we have uh, an, a 10-inch tablet. Um, so in that case, when it comes to multiple devices, this would be the same. It gives us pretty much the same screen area as a desktop or a laptop. So we can have the same layout. We don't necessarily need to rearrange on a different device. But um, well, the type of pinpoint accuracy that you can get with the mouse, you cannot get with your finger. It's not very really user friendly. So even though, you know, again, as a tester, you'd want to try and experience then this as truly as a learner and see how comfortable is the interaction. And in this case, it wouldn't be if we had it laid out um, as what we did on the left. So looking at the content, then we can choose to change the layout uh, for the same size of device then but where, where the nature, it's a touch device as opposed to a non-touch device, and maybe spread out the uh, draggable options, the green options a little bit, increase their height, and just make them easier for a learner to catch. So um, multi-device testing does also involve that, that um, area of you know, really experiencing it as a user and seeing um, how happy you are, basically, uh, navigating and using the e-learning. Sorry, um, here's another aspect, um, again, which relates to interactivity. Uh, so on a desktop, um, the nature of the interactivity is that you drag and drop uh, steps in a process to rearrange them, to put them into the correct sequence. And on a desktop, you can see all the steps at one point, and so it's easy to sort of pick it up with the mouse and, and put it into a different place. When we get onto a smaller, the smallest device than smartphone, we can't see all the um, steps at one point, and so if we needed to pick up one, we'd sort of need to drag it down, 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 down as we pass through the steps and then decide where to release it, which may not be the friendliest of interactivities. So um, in this case, yes, that's something to watch out for as a tester, and um, what we then choose to do as a part of our responsive design is to change the nature of the interactivity. So on a smaller device then, um, rather than drag and drop, uh, you have arrows for each step, and you can sort of move that step up or down um, in relationship to the above, to the step above or below it, uh, to rearrange it. Um, navigation cues also is possibly an additional aspect that comes in when we're looking at multi-device testing. So again, if you put yourself in the learner's shoes, do you know what to do when you're on each of the different devices? Do you know how you're supposed to interact with the content? So either it's intuitive, um, depending sometimes on how used to um, you know, that device we are, um, or, or maybe we need to be clearer, the design needs to be clearer, there need to be visual cues, 
Um, and again, the visual cues then will need to be device appropriate. So here is something that would be a good visual cue for the nature of the interactivity on a tablet. But the same interactivity, if we had it on a desktop, we wouldn't be able to you know, swipe to rotate the car. So we would probably want to put in maybe a slider or some, some types of buttons then to rotate the car. And we would then need to have a different um, visual instruction or, or visual cues then uh, for a desktop device. Um, navigation was another big usability point um, what, that we found when, when testing for, multi, for designing and testing for multiple devices. Uh, so on larger devices, you could show the whole GUI, you could show all the controls and you know, up at the first layer. Um, when you go into smaller devices, it won't all fit. It would get really squished and again, usability viewpoint, you wouldn't be able to really interact with those controls. So we found that it's useful then to um, layer our controls. So up front, keep the most commonly used controls, and then at a second level then, layer the controls. And again, you know, as testers, so while these are design aspects, as testers, these are aspects that we, we needed to look at also while, while doing our multi-device testing. Um, and we could also then give feedback um, to programmers uh, because we're actually experiencing then the, the convenience or the inconvenience of, of uh, taking the learning on, on different devices. Uh, when it comes to compliance testing, you know, it could be SCORM, AICC, or um, nowadays XAPI, or TINCAN. Yes, we needed to check that on multiple devices. Um, for typical parameters, then like um, bookmarking, um, status, score, etc. And when it came to multi-device testing, there was an additional check that would come into the picture, which is for sequencing, uh, which is basically continuity across devices. So if I start something on a smartphone and I continue it on a desktop, can I continue from where I left off? Does, it, you know, does the e-learning remember where I left off on, on the smartphone, and, and do I then get a seamless experience? Um, sequencing will only happen if the same LMS is accessible from all devices. And probably if the learner is online, then um, each time, you know, when, when accessing the, the e-learning from each device, or if there's some kind of offline player compatibility, you know, that the LMS um, offers, or if the LMS has its own offline player or, or mode or something like that. Um, so yes, sequencing may or may not be a parameter to test with multi-device testing, depending on, on, on the technology and, and the um, specifications. Um, performance testing is, is another thing that might have certain additional parameters when it comes to um, testing for multiple devices. And one of them is to see how interruptions are handled. So if you're on a phone or a tablet and a message comes in or a phone call comes in, how does your e-learning behave? Is it able to handle that or um, not? Which is not something we used to have to test or test that much then when it comes to a desktop. Um, again, in, in terms of you know, poor performance connectivity, um, would become a parameter. So each device or each device type is connecting maybe in a different way and um, sometimes through different uh, strength of connection. Um, and so it might differ. You might have a good experience on a tablet, for example, connected you know, through Wi-Fi, but somehow on, on a desktop it doesn't work that well through, through the broadband. So again, different considerations that come in. And sometimes package size is also a consideration. Um, related to connectivity in a way, but then as a tester, maybe you know you you want to look at that package size and even get into it and see, uh, look at for example the number of images that are in the package and, and the size of those those image files. Maybe that is contribution contributing to lower performance in some cases, and then that's a feedback then that you know goes to the development team in terms of how could we make this package less heavy. So that's sort of uh, maybe a quick glimpse into some of the common issues that we we encountered um, while while our team was was testing on, on multiple devices, and uh, for us a lot of this learning then came um, while developing uh, and testing our our um, FRED framework. So uh, earlier Jeevan did mention that uh, tools that we we used some testing tools and simulators, and um, we found that they could be helpful in, in some ways. Uh, the tools and simulators that we did explore were, I think, designed um, you know, for, for testing websites um, on, on multiple devices and not really 
um, catered or specifically um, made for testing e-learning. Um, but nevertheless, we still thought, well, let's see if you know they could be useful in any way. So again, we'd just like to share what we found them to be useful for and where we faced, um, again, maybe limitations or challenges when it came to testing e-learning on multiple devices. So the first tool we tried was Ghost Lab. Um, this is a tool that allows us to, to wirelessly pair um, iOS, Android, Windows, and BlackBerry devices to, to a main computer, and then carry out synchronous testing. Um, so again, with GhostLab, the, the, the great thing is that it's on actual devices. So you're connecting up then a whole set of actual devices so that you can, there are, you can get that experience um, that you get on a real device. Um, because it's concurrent testing, um, Yes, if, if you make a change, for example, maybe changing page content, uh, clicking next to, to load the next page, um, clicking an element um, of an interactivity, you can simultaneously see um, the effect of that on all connected devices and quickly spot if anything is, is you know, if there's an issue on any of the devices or combinations. Um, we found Ghost Lab especially useful for checking uh, visuals and content alignment, you know, at a quick glance. You can see how it's looking on, on a multitude of devices of, of different sizes and types. Um, we also really liked it for joint reviews. So when a group of us would sort of each take one device, one connected device, um, different configurations, and then we were able to you know, go through the course together, and each of us would, would see how it was looking on, on the device that you know, we were assigned to. Um, and it was also useful, I think our testing team found it useful for doing the quick final run through maybe prior to, to a release uh, or, or a delivery. Um, another thing is that um, from a developer's viewpoint also, a tool like GhostLab we found useful um, for just quickly checking, you know, immediately code changes. So I make a change to the code and I can immediately just, just take a quick view of um, how it's reflecting then on each of those uh, devices. <clears throat> And it was also uh, useful, it can be useful for testing text-based courses. Another uh, tool that we tried was Adobe Edge Inspect, um, which again displays a synchronized output on physical devices. So again, here we actually have the um, devices coming in. Um, Adobe In Edge Inspect allows testing on Android and um, I <coughs> sorry, Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as Kindle Fire. Um, it works a bit differently from uh, Ghost Lab. So you need to install the main application on a desktop computer, and then you launch the course on your connected uh, devices through Chrome browser. And then you can access the synchronized course uh, through the Edge Inspect app on your connected devices. I'm sorry, you, you, lo you launch it on Chrome on the desktop and uh, through the Edge Inspect app on connected devices. Um, so Edge Inspect loads only HTML pages. So if you'd like to control course level navigation uh, synchronously on, on all your devices through the main desktop, then you'd need to be looking at something that has a separate URL for every page. Um, so this makes uh, this tool efficient for testing, you know, for example, Lectora-based courses or, or any other HTML courses where, you know, each page that are structured so that each page ha has a different URL. Again, for page level interactivities, you can synchronously control and look at them, um, you know, through the main desktop. Providing your content, uh, whatever appears on, on click, um, is available on a separate URL. Um, so these are the two that we tested, and um, here's what we found challenging, maybe, from, from an e-learning viewpoint. Uh, one is, um, well, of course, it's difficult to keep your eyes on so many devices at the same time. So while you can see the end state um, of what has loaded, you may not be able to watch the actual loading on you know, at the same time on so many devices. And um, a lot of our e-learning courses do have audio. Um, some have audio that just plays through, and a lot of them have audio which is synced to what's happening on screen. Now that's something that you cannot really test um, synchronously. There's no way that you can look at how the syncing is working on different devices at the same time. You really have to go one at a time. Um, we also found it inconvenient to test uh, certain types of interactivities, although uh, we must admit that that could be because of our approach to responsive learning. So we discussed this example before, where the nature of the interactivity changes when you go onto a smaller device. So now what happens is if I drag and drop you know, on a connected uh, tablet, nothing 
really changes, and um, I'm not sure if you noticed that, but something has changed in the sequence here on the tablet. But because the nature of the interactivity is different on the smartphone, a synchronous testing tool, th there's no effect then on the smartphone. So you then have to go and change something again manually on the smartphone, and again vice versa, nothing changes on the uh, tablet. So if interactivities are designed in this manner, then synchronous testing tools um, may not help in testing that. Again, uh, here's another example. Um, here we have arrows then on, on, on the tablet portrait view and you can see the content up front. We've chosen to layer that content and change the nature of the interactivity on the uh, smaller device, on the smartphone. So if I change something on the smartphone, I've expanded one of the points, nothing has changed changed um, synchronously, nothing changes on the portrait tablet. Um, for courses with the single URL, uh, depending on the tool that you're using, again, you may need to manually advance the page or manually work through an interactivity on connected device, which becomes a longer process. And also, depending on how, uh, how, that, how you actually launch your course on the connected device, um, you may or may not be able to check browser-related issues. Okay, um, we also tried a browser stack, which is a cloud-based simulator, um, and we found it could be helpful for testing some parameters. Um, so, for example, we found it uh, useful for testing text alignment, um, and also for testing, you know, we were able to catch visual issues like crooked button edges, um, which were affecting correctly, um, accurately then in, in the simulated uh, window that simulated browser stack window that we were looking at. Um, we tried some simulators, um, you know, SDK simulators. These are local simulators. Um, for iOS and uh, Windows simulators, we found we were able to check content and alignment and layouts quite accurately. So here what we're seeing on, on, on the uh, simulator on the left, it shows exactly what you would see on the real uh, portrait tablet. Um, we did, however, encounter some inaccuracies. Um, same thing goes for the Windows simulator. Um, with Android simulator, we got uh, some inaccuracies. Um, and, and strangely enough, it was the other way around. So the simulator was showing you know, cut content, but when we looked at it on the actual device, it was correct. So we were actually logging issues, and then um, you know, the developers were saying, but no, you know, there is no issue. Um, so here again, the, simula the, the simulator was telling us that you know you got overflowing content here. Um, it's coming out of your holder, and when we looked at it on the actual uh, smartphone, it was okay. It was showing properly within um, within the, the holder. So after uh, videos, also um, here in our Android simulator, it um, it shows that the video is not playing. It's not launched. But when we launched it on the actual tab, um, the video played just fine. So again, um, after trying some simulators, um, we realized we couldn't really get away from the fact that um, well, simulators don't allow us to test the actual experience. So with a browser stack um, or, or edge inspect, we had actual physical devices connected. With simulators, uh, no, you, you don't actually get your hands on the actual physical device. So you can't test actual learner experiences. Um, and so you could then have certain inaccuracies or performance mismatches, uh, which actually could come from the simulator machine configuration resolution, um, and, and which actually would not be there on the uh, actual device. Again, we would not be able to check, we were not able to check, you know, real-time physical device aspects. Um, so could be battery life, charging, could be bandwidth speed, you know, connectivity-related issues. Um, we also couldn't check anything that our e-learning might have had, which was dependent on device features like maybe you know camera or, or, um, or location-based um, information, anything like that. Um, nor could we simulate interrupts. Um, and finally, while well, our e-learning obviously has a lot of custom interactions, mm -hmm. and when it comes to multiple devices, you'd have touch devices specifically, you'd have gestural navigation coming in. And with the simulator, then you cannot have the actual tactile experience. You can't evaluate that on the device. Um, additionally, with specifically with cloud-based simulators, 
sometimes content loading or the speed or the smoothness of animations can vary uh, based on the connection. So again, sometimes we found ourselves, you know, logging issues. Um, so content wasn't uh, completely displayed or we were not able to click on the button um, in a question, uh, sorry, an option button in, in a question. But that wasn't actually an issue, it turned out. It was because, you know, the content just hadn't loaded correctly then on that simulator because of the speed of the connection. So it wasn't, it wasn't a true issue that was getting logged. Um, and yes, that can also cause some interactivity uh, to be difficult to test. Um, so to reiterate, you know, our intention was to try some of these tools and simulators and just see how they could be of use to us when we wanted to test e-learning on multiple devices. Um, so they were created for testing websites. And yeah, they have, some of them can be useful for test, testing certain aspects of um, e-learning. Um, and, and for certain other aspects, and on the whole, uh, we found that you know, we, we needed to have those physical setups and combinations and do a certain amount of manual testing on those. So at this point, I'm going to hand back to Jeevan uh, just to tell, us, to tell you a little bit about our multi-device testing lab. Um, Jeevan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let me just uh, get the controls and, uh, or if you can flick the slides for me, that'll be great, uh, Gita. That'll be great. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So, look, um, I think the you know the, the reason why we thought we might um, set up a testing lab is to help our customers focus on um, the the value added activities you know which us uh, technology and learning professionals are involved in, which is you know kind of analysis, design, etc. And then you know testing is such an important uh, aspect of the whole development process, but one that uh, you know uh, can be uh, done. Uh, you know, I guess uh, by people who have the right infrastructure and the expertise, it doesn't really value add as much as some of the other parts. Um, and indeed, even within testing, you know, um, there is the project management of testing or the, doing the test, developing the test cases. Uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, um, I think I think it is um, a real um, a need for a service provision that has all those combinations and infrastructure that's required and that's what we decided to do was actually set up a lab because we've been I guess uh, leading the way in mobile learning and we have come across all the issues and we know what's going to happen uh, from from experience and as you can see from the screenshot is that we do actually have the infrastructure so different tablet sizes uh, operating systems uh, etc um, so this is a lab so it's basically a physical room uh, and uh, you know there's a team that you know, um, sit in the sit in the lab and uh, test according to all the different devices. Uh, the infrastructure, as you can see, is um, that uh, you know we've got the different operating systems, and obviously this uh, list will keep on uh, expanding. Uh, you know, we will definitely, based on our consumer feedback, um, you know, kind of stick to the most commonly used operating system because, like. We saw it's almost mathematically impossible to um, to cater for every variation uh, that there is. Um, so we've got this list of uh, infrastructure, and uh, of course, increasing uh, that uh, that that list will increase. Uh, but I guess what is really more important, as I mentioned, was really that we've got a lot of experience. We've got about 10, the company is 10 years old, so we've been developing courses for um, online courses for 10 years for companies all around the world um, and uh, you can see that you know we've kind of have more than 10 years of flash based output uh, development capabilities but um, at least I can speak from Australia and in Asia Pac I think I in the past one year we've not built a single course that was in flash they've been all HTML5 with some combination of HTML4 courses so we have definitely moved into the uh, the HTML and the multi device world so you can see that uh, while we've got uh, had a uh, flash legacy uh, for uh, more than 3 years we've been uh, we been well, I guess we've taken the the lead, the the lead on building and testing HTML based uh, outputs and, and courses, uh, so we've got the experience um, and uh, we uh, I think one uh, case study or one example uh, that we've done for a customer recently just to relate a story is that one of the courses uh, that they had built uh, which was deployed on on, on the sum total system uh, wasn't operating properly so the the completions weren't coming back and they weren't quite sure if there was something wrong with the coding in the in the course or there was something wrong with the the network uh, you know so they gave us a course and we did and uh, tested 
pretty much the code and optimized and and you know did all the things and uh, uh, you know despite that there was an issue um, and then the the conclusion that the, the customer got to was that it's not the course it's something to do with the network and they got their IT people involved um, so yes yeah, so we've been also involved with uh, another Australian company in terms of uh, you know testing their um, their um, their I guess they're flash-based courses to see how much of it would work on what kind of devices and how much effort would be required to convert that, and that's another area that we're doing a lot of work is the bulk conversion of flash courses into into HTML. So um, you know that's um, it's um, the the one thing that uh, if you can go to the previous slide was uh, something that we is the Fred uh, framework uh, that I want to mention um, is that standing for the framework for responsive e-learning development uh, is something that uh, we've built based on all the challenges and issues that we've you know faced building courses for the past uh, more than three years now um, so I will take you to the uh, the process next uh, the next slide and essentially this is the process so what we do is uh, you know um, we we start from any point in the testing cycle so no matter who builds the courses, for example, you, somebody, somebody else has built it for you or you've built it yourself, you can actually give it to us and we'll take the course away and test it as an independent um, testing agency. Um, and to do that, we obviously will have a discussion with you regarding your requirements and the, op uh, the, the, um, the operating system, etc. Um, so we'll understand your requirements and then um, you know, put together a test strategy. Um, and get that approved by you before we actually commence the testing. So then we get into a test cycle execution, and um, we um, we sh probably should have shown a, a sample report of, of what we deliver. But certainly, it's a fairly detailed report of all the testing that we've done across all devices, uh, with um, you know some and you know we sometimes we go beyond our mandate. And if we do find a problem, we can even suggest what the solution may be, and we're happy to fix the course, or you can you know send it back to your vendors or fix it yourself. Um, so that's the uh, that's the process, um, and I think um, you know that's uh, that's the that's about our capability. I um, we are very confident that uh, our services will be taken up because you know you would rather spend the budget on things like business analysis, instructional design, increasing the interactivity, and uh, you know um, and testing could be you know done by people like ourselves who've got the infrastructure and skills. So. Um, this is where we'd like to stop. What I'd like to see, if there are any questions, we'd uh, you know, certainly love to answer any questions that you may have. So you can either send it through, you can send it to the chat box, and uh, the team can, uh, you know, the team can bring up or ask the questions. Um, so you know, really looking forward to that, especially from people who, 50% of the audience, who have experience in testing across desktop, tablet, plus smartphone. So um, any any questions would be most welcome. Uh, so put them on the on the chat, uh, and we'll wait uh, wait for that. For a few minutes. Okay, so um, yep. So I'll just type in here. Or you know, even your experiences, or uh, you know, if you've got any scary to stories to tell us, that'll be uh, that'll be good. So uh, certainly welcome any questions that you might have. Okay, no questions. Looks like we've done uh, a very good job in uh, presenting. So I think this is probably where we will end. So I'd like to, you know, thank thank everyone um, that uh, uh, that took the time to participate in the session. Uh, and look, uh, we did delve into the technicalities and there's a lot more technicalities for those people who are interested and we're really happy to provide you the white papers and resources that are available. Um, so yeah, look, thank you very much and um, I appreciate uh, the time that you spent here and we look forward uh, from hearing from you. But yeah, look, we, we're here for the next five, ten minutes. Uh, we stay online and if you've got any questions, if you want to have a chat with us, we're most welcome to, uh, to talk to you. Okay, actually we have a few questions, sorry. Um, Dave, um, there's one question from Dave and um, Gira. Can you, if you can jump in, that'll be great. Great. Um, um, from uh, Dave, the question is: In testing for the tablet environment, adapting for the touch interface has has a big effect. It's actually a comment, um, and uh, you know, navigation elements are different from the desktop, and that is so true. Uh, Dave, uh, as you're aware, that 
the the entire paradigm is quite um, quite uh, different, um, and it's 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 just the storyboarding is almost different. And um, we've got another question before, but Gita, just you know, how do you how do learning designers and testing people move from this uh, you know mindset of PC and just a mouse to something that's touch? And how do you uh, you know is there is there is there something you can do to how you design things or, or how you test? Oh, wow, Javen. Well, thanks for asking such an easy question there. Um, uh, you, I think a lot of it for us was uh, through Fred, and it was, it was again about the, the, the process. Again, when it comes to responsive learning, there are two approaches. So either you go desktop first, um, and you sort of uh, gracefully degrade, or else you go mobile first, and you progressively enhance. So there you'll come to, you know, what is your primary device? In a lot of cases, we found that uh, still the requirement that came was, you know, we needed to run on desktops um, and tablets, and sort of like an oh, and also if it runs on on smartphones, that that's great, but the primary devices were still the larger larger ones. Um, I think uh, so far that we haven't really come across uh, one where there's a specific requirement and where the smartphone is is the primary device. So in that case, what, what we do is we, we sort of pick these three, um, uh, three breakpoints or, or three layout uh, sizes, I suppose we could say. So we, we, we look at the content. How, we, how would we put it onto a desktop or a larger tablet? Because those would sort of equate. And when we get onto then a portrait tablet, what would we want that content to do? Right? How would we want to change anything in its display or even in its interactivity or not? And again, on a smartphone, so we tend to take iPad uh, portrait and iPhone portrait, um, and that will like a smaller iPhone, um, and just see then, um, you know, how, how, how will it look on that? Um, and we, we fix the layouts then with our, with our graphic designers. Um, and, and then accordingly, then the flexibility also comes in between those, and, and we found that to be a helpful way of seeing how, how things are going to behave on these different devices when we're doing our instructional and graphic design. Well, uh, there's also a question. There are actually two questions around the general um, question about you know time and costs. Um, so that's a, that's really is a very difficult question to answer. I mean, if you were to ask me how you know to build a course, how much will it take? I'll tell you medium interactivity. You know, uh, if it is for HTML5 and for tablet PC, I'll be able to actually give you an estimate pretty easy. Testing is a little bit different. Uh, so it's a service provision. So what we do is we look at uh, you know we look at um, the the amount of work that's involved and then you know put an hourly rate to that and, and give you the effort. So um, so it's really um, the complexity of the course and also the number of devices. So it's a difficult question to answer, but uh, you know we can uh, if you can send me an email, we can give you an hourly rate, uh, and that'll give you some idea. I don't know if uh, Gear, if you got a better answer than that. Um, no, it it does it does depend it will depend on on the type of course, the, the type of content, the, the range of devices and combinations. So no, I, I don't think there's, there's one specific answer for that. Yeah, look, all we can say is that we're pretty pretty efficient uh, because we've got the setup. So it will probably, you know, I won't put my um, you know, hand over my heart and promises, but I think we'll be more efficient uh, just because of the infrastructure, the skills, um, and uh, the experience that we have in terms of testing. So whatever it might take other, other customers, for example, to test, uh, we will probably do it faster and more efficiently. But I think I think that's where we'll finish. Um, um, so I think um, can you give me some link to learn HTML5 to mobile device course conversation? Uh, There's one course. Look, there are a lot of a lot of course. There's a lot of actually HTML5 is a very um, it's a very um, scary area at the moment because there's no tools that turn out any perfect. Uh, um, output, so we need to work a little bit. But I think that's where we finish. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, please feel free to close your browser and uh, and go. Um, but uh, we've got a lot of resources on our uh, website, white pages, um, ebooks, etc. So we we look forward to seeing you. And please do send us an email if you need to get any other information. Thanks a lot.